On the 28th of October 2004, experienced cave diver Dave Shaw was preparing to enter one of the deepest freshwater sinkholes on the planet. He was aiming to set several new dive records and had prepared about as well as he could have for this attempt. He had a full team with him, including a good friend of his who will be acting as his deep support. All set up, the dive team dived below the thick layer of duckweed and began their descent. Dave and his deep support dived down to a depth of 120 metres, where they parted ways and Dave swam into the depths alone. Before long, he reached the slanted cave floor at a depth of just over 240 metres. Exhilarated, Dave swam along the cave floor, inching deeper into the cave, swimming slowly to avoid kicking up any silt. He scanned around him, the beam from his torch swinging through the darkness. As he continued down, heading for the far reaches of the cave, the beam of his torch reflected back off something. Upon closer inspection, Dave realised that his light had landed on some dive gear, a wetsuit, and the skeletal remains of the diver they belonged to. He knew without a doubt that he had come across the body of a young man that had perished in the cave ten years prior. From that moment on, Dave knew that he would do whatever he could to get that young man out. Unfortunately, by the end of this endeavour, the sinkhole would have claimed another life. This is the tragic story of Dave Shaw and the Bushman's Hole. Bushman's Hole is a large, submerged sinkhole located in South Africa. It is one of the deepest freshwater caves on Earth and is a popular spot for those interested in cave diving. Dave's dive that October was almost 10 hours long and when he surfaced, he immediately told his companions that he would be returning soon to recover the body he had found. And his friends knew that there would be no talking him out of it. Dave Shaw was not just an avid cave diver, but also an accomplished airline pilot. Originally from Australia, he had moved to Hong Kong with his wife in 1989, where he continued to fly planes for work. His interest in cave diving was one that he shared with his son, who had, in fact, introduced him to the hobby several years earlier. Dave developed an instant obsession with diving from that point on, taking any opportunity he could to be in the water. As the years passed and his experience grew, he upgraded his gear and began shifting towards technical diving. Technical diving is any diving that is considered to be beyond the scope of recreational, although what exactly qualifies as such is often highly contested within the diving community. Broadly speaking, a dive below 40 metres or requiring special gas mixtures would probably fall within this category. Dave loved diving down into the depths of caves, exploring through the darkness, knowing that very few people had been there before him. It wasn't about the depth that he reached, but about the location. He loved exploring caves, each of them unique and many with interesting histories. It was this chase for adventure and exploration that had allowed him to gain so much experience and expertise in the field, and with that experience, came opportunities within the community. He had originally been in Bushman's Hole two days before his own record-setting dive, helping a fellow diver complete a different world record. The extreme depths of this cave made it incredibly dangerous, which is why divers always worked in teams and took as many precautions as possible. Dave knew the dangers well, and was well aware that tragedy had already befallen this cave. In 1993, a diver named Ebden Layden passed out during a dive in the cave at around 60 metres. His dive buddy was able to pull him to the surface, but he was unable to be resuscitated. Then, a year later, during the setup for a world record attempt, another young diver, D'Andrea, became separated from his team at around 50 metres. It is assumed that he too fell unconscious and, as a result, drowned. Searches were conducted, but they were unable to locate Dion's body. I have no doubt that Dave would have at least had a passing thought about Dion during both of his dives into Bushman's Hole, but I'm sure he was not expecting to actually find the young man, 
as many divers before him had failed to do so. However, he did find Dion, and so took it upon himself to carry out a recovery mission. Now, Dave did attempt to move Dion when he first discovered his body, but was unable to do so, as over the years, his gas cylinders and other gear had sunk into the thick mud on the cave floor. Trying to dig him out at that depth would have been incredibly dangerous for Dave, as any kind of exertion while that deep underwater can have serious consequences. Divers have to be very careful to control their breathing while underwater, otherwise their bodies may begin to accumulate excess amounts of carbon dioxide, a condition known as hypercapnia. If this imbalance is not corrected quickly, it can cause the diver to fall unconscious, which, when they are hundreds of metres underwater, spells certain death. Dave had been unable to bring Dion out during that dive, but he immediately set to work planning a recovery operation. It was a huge task, involving many experienced divers, police, a ton of equipment, including a specially made body bag, and an incredibly detailed plan of action. Dave needed to nail down exactly how long it would take him to perform each task. For example, freeing Dion from his gear, getting his remains into the body bag, attaching the strong metal cable to the cylinders beneath Dion, and then making his way back to the surface whilst pulling the body behind him. Timing was so important as Dave only had five minutes of bottom time, and then he would need to begin his journey back to the surface. Dave worked for weeks putting the plan together, handpicking his dive team and discussing the best way to approach the retrieval. Finally, on the 8th of January the following year, three months after Dave had found Dion's body, they were ready to begin the operation. Despite the huge risk involved in the recovery attempt, Dave was optimistic. He also stated several times that this was, at the end of the day, just an attempt and that he could choose to abandon it at any point. A recovery attempt at that depth was unheard of and he was well aware that he could have missed something in his plans. On top of this, he also knew that any dive, regardless of depth, came with many risks. He spoke to his deep support diver and close friend Don Shirley who confirmed that he was prepared to descend to the bottom to help Dave if needed, and on top of this, both of them informed their team that should something go wrong resulting in their deaths, they were to be left down there and not recovered. They didn't want anyone risking their lives. With that out of the way, and all the preparations in place, Dave and Don got ready for the dive. The weeds had been cleared off the surface, allowing the sunlight to shine deep into the water, it was just before 6am and the area was buzzing with activity, despite the early hour. Divers were busy checking and double checking their gear, going over the plan for the hundredth time. Police divers and paramedics were also on the scene, ready to step in if needed. Dave and Don pulled on their dry suits, feeling confident and in high spirits. Dave had been provided with a camera mounted on a caving helmet to document this dive, and he spent some time fiddling with it, making sure it was set up and attached securely. Don was just happy that he was actually able to take part in the dive, as a gear malfunction the day before had almost forced him to pull out. Soon, it was time to begin the dive, and with one last look around, Dave smiled, shook Don's hand, and dipped below the water. Don would be following after him 13 minutes later, but for now, he just had to wait. DeAndrea's parents waited for this moment before heading down to the water, not wanting to put pressure on Dave to bring their son's remains back with him. Dave dropped down the shot line that they had placed to the bottom of the cave, and he did so at such a pace that he actually arrived at the bottom almost two minutes ahead of schedule. He then wasted no time in following the line he had left for himself during his last trip, which he had attached to Dion's body. This allowed him to locate Dion very easily, and before long, he saw the eerie shape pop into the view of his light. The torch that Dave used was a hand-mounted one, and he would normally sling the wire over his shoulders and around his neck if he needed to work on something. That way, it wouldn't get in the way or get tangled with anything. However, the camera and helmet made this difficult to do, so instead, he allowed it to free float beside him, freeing up his hands. Aware of the seconds ticking by, he quickly got to work. 
Dave had expected Dion's remains to be negatively buoyant, having consulted several experts on the matter. This conclusion had been reached as the only visible parts of Dion's body had already been reduced to bone, but underneath his wetsuit, Dion's body was surprisingly well preserved, and in that state of decomposition, it would actually float. This means that when Dave pulled out the specially made silk body bag and began pulling it up over Dion's legs, the body began to move. Making this worse, the equipment had somehow become unstuck from the mud and was no longer holding Dion in place, allowing his body to shift further in the water with each movement that Dave made. Struggling to control the now floating body, Dave's breathing began to speed up. He tugged on the body bag, attempting to shimmy it up over Dion's knees, but it caused the body to roll and also kicked up a bunch of silt, obstructing his vision. This movement also caused the guideline that he had placed down to move and become tangled with the wire of his torch. He noticed this immediately and worked to free it, his breathing increasing further with the exertion. At this point, nitrogen narcosis would definitely have been affecting Dave's cognitive abilities, he would have felt drunk, which would have made it hard for him to react to the unexpected change from his plan. He also could have become hyper-focused on his task, which is why, instead of realising that Dion could be pulled up by the line now that he was free, he continued working with the body bag. In the original plan, Dave was meant to cut Dion free from his gear once the body bag was up to his chest, and Dave did pull his knife out at some point, hovering over Dion like he knew he was meant to be doing something, he just wasn't sure exactly what. Then, in a moment of either clarity or autopilot, Dave looked at his dive computer. Five and a half minutes had passed. It was time to leave. Dave turned, following his guideline back, his breathing laboured, more grunts than breaths now. He swam forward, but then felt something tug at him, pulling him back to Dion. His torch wire had again become tangled in the web of guideline. He tugged at it desperately, trying to free it, but it was no use. And all that movement had caused him to breathe even heavier, and, as mentioned earlier, this is incredibly dangerous for divers. Dave soon fell unconscious, not far from the shot line. Don Shirley descended into the water, and as he reached his intended depth, the clear water allowed him to see Dave's torchlight below him. But something was wrong. The light wasn't moving, and there were no bubbles rising from below. Don immediately decided to head down, wanting to help his friend. Unfortunately, a large crack stopped him in his tracks. The same gear that had that fault the day before had now been crushed by the pressure, and it was a key piece of gear, measuring the oxygen levels in his rebreather. He was now in a very serious situation himself. Don had to switch to self-preservation mode and began what would be a very long ascent, during which he would have to manually monitor and change his oxygen levels and calculate his new decompression times. As he rose in the water, he watched as Dave's light slowly faded out below him, swallowed by the darkness. He met up with the other support divers, who were going to head past him to search for Dave, but Don stopped them, writing on his slate, Dave not coming back. This slate was passed from diver to diver until it reached the surface, where the terrible news was broken to the crowd. Even though they were heartbroken by this news, the dive team did not have time to dwell on it, as they were informed that Don was now in trouble, suffering from decompression sickness. This had caused him to become incredibly dizzy, and he had to be clipped to the shot line so he wouldn't drift off and get lost. Divers took it in turns to stay with him as he slowly made his way to the surface. After over 12 hours in the water, Don emerged, and had to spend many days in a recompression chamber. His balance was never the same afterwards, but he was eventually able to dive again. Several days after the tragedy, a crew of divers were tasked with cleaning up the site, removing the lines and cylinders from the cave. During the third day, they were hauling up the last of the cylinders, 
using boys to help lift them, when they spotted two figures floating together in the darkness. It was Dave Shaw and DeAndrea. Dave's buoyant gear, along with the effects of decomposition, had caused his body to float upwards, dragging Dion with him. Dave had accomplished his final mission, to bring Dion back to the surface, giving his parents closure. The camera that Dave had been wearing is how we know of his final moments, and it is sad to think that without it, Dave may have survived this trip, as he would have been able to hook his torch wire around his neck as he usually did thus preventing it from becoming tangled with the guideline. His family, although understandably devastated by his loss, knew that there was no way they could ever have stopped Dave from doing that dive, and ultimately, they took some solace knowing that he died doing something that he loved, whilst trying to help another family heal. Dave's ashes were scattered from a mountain top in South Africa, so that he could continue his adventures where he had left off. If you're interested in going a bit more in depth with this story, particularly the lead up to Dave's final dive, you can check out the website that Dave himself created, where he talks about his previous dives and the body recovery plan. I'll leave a link down in the description if you'd like to check it out. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel and leave any suggestions for future videos down in the comments section below. Thanks for joining me for this story, and keep yourself safe out there.